institutions like Delaware State are going to have to ask the question, what do our employers want? And what do we have to do to do a better and more effective job to ensure that immediately upon graduation, those young men and young women whose families have worked so hard to make sure they can get a college education actually have employment. And we know something about the black community. Our community has, uh, our college graduates have double the rate of unemployment and three times the rate of underemployment of other, of equal, of graduates of, you know, of people with equal education but not the same skin color. So we know in our community, we've got to still work harder. We've got to make sure our kids get more because there are still other obstacles and barriers that we have to confront. So one of the reasons why I am here today is because we have got to get our communities to recognize that this is not a game. This is not a dress rehearsal. This is the real thing. And if we want our children, and I want our children, I want my children, I want my grandchildren to do better than I did, then we are going to have to do more. You can put this up one, and we just don't work together. When he gets it together, I'm going to give his speech. <laughs> uh, there's always a technical issue. I'm, fine. I'm not going to hold that, though. I can't. I can't, because if I do that, I can't change the pages. So, <laughs> the point, I, I mean, I, I'm so delighted that there are so many of you here. That people have worked hard to get you here. Because I'm going to tell you something. This is serious business. This is serious business. And I am so delighted that today, part of the reason I was here is because, you know, we, gotta, we had to, you know, fire you up and activate you so that uh, you could go out to, the, to, to Dover and say to the state legislature, don't you override the governor's veto on opt-out. Now, you know, I can't speak for every parent, but let me just tell you about me as a grandparent. My children are going to take, my grandchildren are taking every test that they need to take to reassure me and their parents that, that they are getting the education they're going to require to compete. And anybody who thinks that our kids are not going to be taking tests for the rest of their lives, they can just forget that. This is a hard life we have to live. There will be assessment and accountability at every stage along the way, and even when we do really well on the test, we still have other barriers. So I'm going to tell you, some of those parents may say, well, I want my children to have more fun. I want my children too, my grandchildren. And I'm gonna tell you, my grandchildren work real hard and they and then now they when they work so hard they know when this they know when they're having fun. <laughs> and they're not working as hard. I just talked to one of my granddaughters. I said, Where are you, Chloe? I'm still at school. And she was in an after school program, but that's where she's supposed to be. These kids got to compete. They don't have to just compete with the kids that they see living a different life and maybe a, you know, a richer life here. They got to compete with the kids in China. And I'm telling those kids are working. And in India. Right? Yeah. Okay, we, we are straight. So seven decades ago, in the Civil Rights Movement, the fight was for school desegregation. The fight to tear down the legal barriers that stood between young African Americans and quality public education. At the US Supreme Court, at Little Rock Central High School, some of us remember, and at schoolhouse doors in Mississippi and Alabama, we won the fight. We remember the Supreme Court's historic school desegregation case under the name of Brown versus Board of Education. But Brown was actually one of five cases. Five cases that included a Delaware case, right? Yeah. All right. Get part. Be Belton. But today, 
as if to prove William Faulkner's dictum that the past is never dead, it's not even past. We are still fighting for an equal education for the right of African Americans and other children of color to get an education that prepares them for success in high school, success in college, and for success after college. The battles we're fighting are the same ones. Our kids still aren't getting as much money for their educations. The buildings may be a little bit better, but they're not as, they don't have all those bells and whistles. Teachers aren't always as well prepared as they are at other schools. So we still fight. It's still separate and unequal. Today's battle is being fought not only in the South, but across the country, including, once again, right here in Delaware. And here in Delaware, it's being led by your courageous governor, Jack Markle, Markell, who has taken, a, uh, taken on the state legislature control, controlled by his own party, that has threatened to veto, uh, to threaten his veto, to override his veto. Well, you know, this, that, I got notice of that on the train. That one, we, we fought that battle successfully, but you know, it's just a battle, it's not the war, right? Brown, Gephardt, and other landmark cases of that era represented the assertion of national authority over local and state school segregation policies. You know, today the pendulum is swinging back. And some people asked me in the little pre-meeting earlier, well, what about the recently passed Every Child Succeeds Act, ESA, returning more power over education to the states? Well, maybe that's a good thing here in Delaware, but I live in Georgia. And I can tell you that our voices are not heard at the Georgia General Assembly the same way they get heard in Washington, D.C. That means that the states need to step up to that responsibility. And that means that this community needs to raise its voice even more to own the push for equality and for excellence. As a Georgia college student 50 years ago, I was able to take part in the civil rights struggle. I could march with Dr. King. I could march with Julius Bond. I could march with John Lewis. Today at the head of the UNCF, the United Negro College Fund, I have made my career working to get students of color the rigorous academic education they need and that we as a nation need to have, lead them to have. I just saw a story about a Delaware State University student, youngest PhD in chemistry. How old is that 21? 21. Now he didn't, he didn't get, he wasn't doing watered down chemistry. Now, he may be smarter than the rest of us, but he got a good education, and he's going to and he's going to be prepared to compete. That's what we want for all of our children: the ability to compete. That there will be other assaults and threats to the progress that we have to make to ensure that our kids get a good, world-class, competitive education. Now let me be clear. Those who favor opt-out, our opponents in this 20, among our opponents in this 21st century civil rights battle, they're not racists. They're not like George Wallace or Ross Barnett. They are state legislators who are listening perhaps too closely to a vocal group of parents who are concerned for their children's education and worrying about the impact of rigorous tests on their kids. I follow the news all the, a couple of weeks ago there was an article in the New York Times about parents at a very wealthy suburban school district in New Jersey. And it was the white parents claiming too much time is spent on rigorous academics here. 
And it was the Asian parents who were saying not enough time <laughs> is being spent. Well, guess who's gonna send their kids to MIT and Caltech and to Harvard? Not those parents who are saying too much time. Now, they may have gotten in there before when they could get in there because they went, you know, they could get, you know, they had that, they get a pass. The competition is rough, team. And maybe they don't want it for their kids. I want it for mine. But despite the sincerity of their intentions, the results of opt-out in New York City and its Long Island and Westchester suburbs show that the impact of what they want to do for their children would weaken test-based accountability and put disadvantaged children, that is low-income and minority students, at even greater risk than they are now. We had 2,300, well, we didn't have, we had a little fewer than that, about 1,000, 1,400 students by the time I left, we had 2,300. We drew students from Louisiana, yes, number one, Texas, Houston, Alabama, Georgia, and Mississippi, but we also drew students from all around the country, California, New York. The students who came to Dillard often graduated at the top of their class. They were salutatorians, they were valedictorians. They uh, had perfect attendance. They won all of the awards. But when we gave them their placement examinations, we found that one out of three of those students required remedial courses. So that they spent two or three, they, they took two or three courses per semester for the first year, taking courses that, for which they got no credit toward graduation. Now you're gonna tell me that those students didn't think they were ready for college? Of course they thought they were ready for college. You're gonna tell me that their parents didn't think that they were ready for college? Of course they thought they were ready for college. But we had to deliver a very tough message. You're not. Things have not improved. The other day, New York Times wrote a story about Greenville, South Carolina, and a high school called Berea High School. And they touted Berea High School has raised its graduation rates from 65% <coughs> to 80. 80% 80 of the Berea High School graduate students will graduate from high school. But the Times also reported that according to college entrance exams administered to every 11th grader in the state last spring, only one in 10 of Berea students were ready for college level work in reading, and about one in 14 were ready for college level math. Now these weren't just black kids in Greenville, South Carolina. And on a separate test of the skills needed to succeed in most jobs, little more than half of the students demonstrated that they could handle the math they would need. Let me tell you something about Greenville. Greenville's got a smart BMW plant. Greenville's got a smart uh, Mercedes plant, the Greenville's a happening place for jobs. But these high school graduates, they couldn't have gotten one of those jobs because they did not have the basic skills. And the, the state of affairs in South Carolina is, respect, is reflected for our children all across this country. I mean, you've had, you've had your kids take an ACT test. I mean, you're going to take it. You can either take ACT or SAT if they're going to go to college. According to ACT, and we partner with them in reporting this back to the community, just 5% of black students are ready for college work in all four of the areas that ACT tests. That means that only five out of 100 students, black students who take that test, across the country 
will take four credit courses in English, reading, math, and science. 95% of the black students who graduate from high school in this country today will be, who go on to college will take one, at least one remedial course. Now just, just imagine, for Latino kids it's 15%. I think for white kids it's 40%. It's bad for everybody. But it's terrible for us. Why am I saying we can't let our students opt out? I want to know. Do you want to know if your child is not ready? And the reality is reflected right here in Delaware. The results of last year's achievement test showed that 23.33 percentage point gap between what white kids, how white kids perform on these exams, and African American students' performance in English. A year later, this past fall, the new and tougher, smarter balance test showed an even larger gap, 27.34 percent, between what how white kids do on this test and black kids do. Our kids can do better. And we must make sure that we see where their problems are and that we're giving them the opportunities to address them while they're still in high school or middle school or elementary school. You know, people say, that education should be the civil rights era, or the civil rights issue of the 21st century. Now I'm old, I remember what it was like. I lived in Alabama in 1961. I know how bad it was. I went to school with a young man named Sammy Young, murdered by the White Citizens Council at the Greyhound bus station in 1965. in Tuskegee. I knew Rosa Parks. I knew Martin Luther King. But what was the difference? It wasn't that they were better than we are today. It's that they, the outrage of having to confront every day a system that said you were not equal, that could treat you any which way, People just said, enough already, we're going to stand up to this. And we did. And we fought. Not violently, but nonviolently, the most powerful tool we could have. You asked Mrs. King, what was the powerful tool that her husband had? It was nonviolent social action. It was people standing up and saying, no more. I don't care how bad you are. I will not tolerate this any longer. You can stick those dogs on me, you can go, you can, you can do those water hoses, and we're not going to take it. Well, you know what? There is an inequality that our children are facing in terms of educational opportunity, which is as life-threatening, which is as life-restricting as any segregation system that ever existed. And it is not going to change unless we make it change. Unless you make it change. You have got to stand up and fight for your own children and for your neighbor's children and for your community's children. It is you. You have the power. And so I know you want to ask a lot of questions about what about this, what about that, what about this. There is the power in this world to transform educational opportunities in Wilmington and in Delaware if we will organize, work together, and just stay at it. We won't stop doing it when our child graduates from high school and goes on to college, or when our grandchild does. We won't stop it until we see that every child the poorest child in our community, the parentless child in our community, the homeless child in our community has the same educational opportunity that the richest child in our community has. That's why we are here tonight. 
because what we see is intolerable and we will not stand for it one more day. United Negro College Fund has been at this work for 72 years. We've raised over $4 billion. We've helped over 400,000 young people graduate from college. Raising the money has been the easy part. Raising the hell is the hard part. And that's what we've got to raise. God bless you.